Then, yeah, just wear the beanie. That's it. That's pretty solid. I feel good about that. That's a good way to start this. Get the attitude up high, you know. Go trade two J's if you could become Wolverine. Where are you getting all this information? I definitely heard some some rumors about it. Are you still going? For, I, I can't get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like you can hear them get the car. I was going to qualify and I was going to drive it out the racetrack. Just threw the hood over the ditch and longest employee of Knox. You did some digging there, huh? Look, this last year, 2023, was insane. I actually had to go to the hospital, if you knew this, uh, but I had a hand injury uh, just due to the number of high fives I received from everybody that saved a couple bucks by using FD Podcast to check out. And if you want to be one of those people, if you give me a wicked high five, make sure to use the code to check out, little coupon code area, just put in FD, just the two letters, podcast, and you'll save some money on your tickets. So why not? If you're coming to the event, save some money. Might as well. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. My name is Jacob Gettens, and today we've got Mr. Nate Chen on. Uh, can I call you Nate Dog? I, I mean, I feel, like, I feel like that's the way to go. Hey, you can call me whatever you want, as long as it's not Nathan. And uh, yeah, Nate's, Nate's great, though, so go I, for it. I, I see Nathaniel everywhere. I, I wasn't sure if that's like something that you lean into or if that's just it like... It just looks cooler, right? It looks longer, it more more fancy than Nate. But at the same time, every time I try to say my name's Nathaniel, they're like, oh, Daniel, nice to meet you. So I'm like, no, oh. you know what? It's just... I think that was like a high school decision. You know, that big transition from eighth grade to high school. I was like, I'm just going to go by Nate or whatever it was. So, yeah. Yeah, I never, I mean, obviously like Jacob is just like what it is. Like I've never had to, to worry about like a conjunction or anything like that. So I get like Jay sometimes, like a lot of like one whole side of my family just calls me Jay, which is, it, I don't, it's not that it's not weird or anything. It's just like, yeah, I expect it from them. But I think if like a random person just came up and called me Jay, I'd be like, what? Like, <laughs> what? I'm like why, why would you call me that? But yeah. Yeah, I like, I, I don't know. I like Nathaniel. Definitely sounds proper. My mom, my mom calls me Nathaniel. That's probably the only, or my dad, my mom and dad call me Nathaniel. My brother calls me Nana because he couldn't pronounce uh, Nathaniel yeah, yeah. when he was, uh, you know, a kid. And yep. And then everyone else just calls me Nate. So, yep. Yeah, I got, I got JB. My, my sisters couldn't call, like couldn't say Jacob when we were younger. So I got JB and they, I, every once in a while they'll still call me that. It's like when I get the full name that, you know, like it strikes fear, right? When you get the first first name, middle name, last name kind of thing, like you know, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> oh but, yeah, yeah. How's uh, how's the off season been going, man? Like how's how's prep been? Are you feeling ready? I mean, you've got a little bit of extra time, obviously, uh, until Atlanta. But uh, how like how are you feeling overall? No, I'm feeling really great. I have had an awesome off season in terms of just securing new partnerships. One of them is uh, S Tech, which happy to talk about later. And Moroso Performance uh, also came on board. Um, Fuel Lab, NGK, Spark Plugs. So those are kind of some of the the newer ones to have on board, which I'm really excited about. A couple of more that you know are putting pen to paper kind of this week. So it's uh, it's been really great. I've gotten a lot of time on the simulator. I've also spent a lot of time at my day job. Uh, took a new role <laughs> recently. So that has been uh, what feels like sometimes all consuming. But uh, also I've been spending a lot of time on my RX-7 in the garage, you know, getting that. That's kind of my demo car. I do events like Hyperfest and going to be looking to doing grid lives this year as well. Uh, nice. So I've done body work for the first time, just haven't <laughs> ever done that before and it's really time consuming as well but uh yeah so it's been uh been a really good off season at the same time i just can't wait to get back out there love going to the tracks and it's pretty cold here and as you can see very gray <laughs> in dc mm -hmm. during the uh the winter time so yeah i love summer just can't wait for it to come around yeah it's a it's a huge balance i mean i know you um i mean it's it's, it's pretty evident if anybody like does like two seconds of research on you that i mean you you work in finance so it's like such a, a juxtaposition, I feel like, to to go from such a corporate, like, I don't know if you're like a suit and tie kind of finance or if you're like more <laughs> like bro finance, but like to go from that into racing has got to almost feel like an alter ego and like to, to, to swap in between the two. You would say, yeah, I mean, you would think so. At the same time, I think both have been really helpful hand in hand at progressing both careers. I would say in the finance world, it's having that understanding of how businesses work, sitting in boardrooms, you know, making high level decisions like that or assisting in those has been really tremendous in my understanding of what companies goals are from a marketing perspective. And I think I can talk to a lot of that and it can be in the same shoes as some of my counterparts at 
at my partners and help them understand how to grow their business. And then on the other side of things, like um, having, you know, running my own business on the racing world has given me more credibility to go out and uh, pitch myself to, you know, potential um, people that are looking to partner with me in, in selling their business or, um, or teaming arrangements or, or anything like that in the, in the business side. So it, it is a hand in hand relationship that I think makes me stand out as a driver and as a program and also makes me stand out on the, on the other side as well. So I love both. Yeah. I, well, we, we talk a lot about finance. I feel like I've been bringing it up more and more with drivers just because it's like this weird, like black box. And like, everybody knows that drifting takes money, but for some reason for years, we just never talked about it. So I feel like for your, obviously like your, your schooling and what you do day to day, like that sets you up in, in a way that mm -hmm. allows for longevity, right? Like I'm sure you still spend in ways that are maybe not like the most safe, I guess. Like, I'm sure there's still times you like look back and you're like, why did I buy that? I know <laughs> I shouldn't have bought that. Like, you know, that impulse control is, is, is still lacking in some cases, but overall, I'm sure you've got a full budget breakdown. I'm sure there's a pretty sick Excel spreadsheet, like ready <laughs> to go with the whole year. Yeah. Look, I would say I've definitely been a drifter more than longer than I've been a finance guy. This has just been my way of securing a route to be in the seat today. So mm. when I was 13, I went to a Formula Drift event, thought it was the coolest thing ever. And I could see a potential path to being a driver one day because it wasn't as intimidating as F1 or NASCAR to get into back then. If you looked at kind of the cars, the level of programs, like, yes, you had people like Reese Miller and Sam Hubinet, Tanner Faust. Those were kind of the, the top guys at the time, but they weren't role. I mean, and there were some big rigs, but there were a lot of guys showing up in open trailers like really small enclosed trailers. And so mm -hmm. it was sort of a calculus of, okay, well, how do I get there? And that's kind of what led me down to the finance path um, in terms of, okay, I want to make money or I need money. My parents aren't writing a check <laughs> into this program. So where is this going to come from? I go to, like, I got into a great school, William and Mary, and it was, okay, what's the best job I could get out of, uh, out of there? And it was either Wall Street or Silicon Valley. And I'm not really much of a computer coder. So that's how <laughs> I ended up on uh, the investment banking front uh, in New York doing sell side consumer m and I have a couple of my deal toys behind me. Um, and then I pivoted to the private equity world uh, a couple of years after my, or I guess two years into my investment banking stint. That's kind of the typical time frame of when you would do that. And now I spend my time focused on defense and government services, which is very emblematic of DC as all of government contracting is kind of based here. And it's been really fun to help build and scale businesses. Um, investment banking is more on the sell side or helping businesses sell. And then now I'm on the buy side, helping put together and grow and scale businesses. And it's it's a really exciting thing to be a part of, for sure. Hmm. Is that, without like getting too far into the weeds, because I don't like lose people on on like finance banking, you know, or, or investment banking or, or any of the acquisition side of things, like right off the bat. But like, are you working with companies to, or are you working with government to invest in, in companies to be able to produce things for government or the other way around? Or how does that work? Yeah. So there are basically um, investors that could be institutional or it could just be wealthy individuals. It's kind of a combination of both institutional, meaning, you know, college endowments, insurance companies, et cetera. And uh, wealthy individuals are, you know, that's pretty self-explanatory, right? But you yeah. basically take that capital, um, pull it together in a fund, which is what most private equity firms are. And then you go out and invest that capital alongside with debt from banks. And you use the money to go buy businesses. And then once you've acquired one, like right now, we I, I sourced last year actually a, a company called Intelligent Group. They're a digital transformation company focused on high-end IT services at the IRS mainly okay. today. And so the roadmap for that is is quite simple. It's we're helping a small business that was traditionally founder-owned and founder-led, and we're building it into a mid-tier prime that ultimately will go out and compete against larges. Like they already actually compete against Deloitte and Booz Allen and oh. Accenture and all of these large companies. Um, but, you know, I think something that happens a lot in the government contracting space or even outside of government contracting is that large companies kind of lose focus on their customer and their ability to deliver. And that gives an opportunity for small businesses to really come in and, and disrupt things, right? And so 
We help them scale by bringing in new management team members. I've actually taken an operational role within the company. And so I'm in the company day to day on like in the weeds, you know, of the BD mm -hmm. side. And we also do things like add on acquisitions, um, you know, different tools and processes that we just, again, we're just here to mature the business and scale it. And that's why it's intellectually very stimulating and obviously very rewarding on the back end when you eventually do sell the business. But it's uh, it's fun to be able to, again, participate in the, the boardroom, lead, you know, be in the management team um, and lead discussions on how to make something better. I mean, I, that's even when you're building a car, that's what you're doing, right? Even when right. you're doing racing and development of parts <clears throat> and, and development of a platform as a, as a car, like you can kind of apply like that same logic and thesis to, uh, to companies as a, as a whole as well. So, yeah. 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 I think that's, I think that's a great comparison too, because you can look at, you know, you take something almost like, uh, I mean, referring back to like Papadakis, where you look at like a chassis where you're like, oh, I see what the development plan is here within drifting. I understand what the investment's going to be like in the development plan of that. And then obviously the goal is to hopefully turn that into something, you know, I just say it's, I, I don't know if like Steph is like producing a bunch of parts to sell, but like that could be a way of doing it. I mean, any, really any part development company is going to do that, right? They'll look at a platform, figure out what the R&D cost is and then go, okay, we have to sell X amount of units before we break even on the R&D and then try to scale that up and then find the next one. So yeah, that's interesting. That's, that's really interesting. I didn't realize like how deep you got into the actual day-to-day -day operations and scaling of it. Cause like from the business side of things, scaling is the most difficult part of, of any company. And that's where most companies break is, is when they have to scale it. Exactly. Because like it's growth is, is kind of painful, right? Like you're, yeah. you're doing like a lot of stuff with like a limited number of people and then you kind of reach a breaking point where you need to hire more. And if you don't, then you're going to lose the growth or not be able to hold on to it. And then you're going to go back down to where you started from. So it's a really tricky process, but I've done it kind of for a number of years at this point. And I've seen, you know, really great management teams. I've seen not so great management teams and have at a high level, like understood what it takes to really scale and grow a business um, from this for the space that I'm, you know, specialized in. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I mean, at this point, though, taking the operational role has kind of gotten me one step further into really being in the weeds, which I think is overall just helpful to me in my career. It also gives me credibility to again, when I'm going out and finding the next company to help build, it's, hey, look, I've lived your, you know, I've lived in your shoes, I've submitted proposals, I've been up, all night yeah. working on all this stuff. And then most deal guys on Wall Street with their fancy suits and all that crap, like they don't get it. Like they, especially in government yeah. services land, there's a really uh, strong pat or a pattern where Wall Street guys think they know everything. They come in, they don't know anything about how government services works and then they get destroyed. They lose all their money. And it's only the people that specialize in this industry actually make money. And so well, in the car yeah. world, it's kind of the same thing too. Yeah. It's it's the difference between uh, just analyzing numbers and then and then actually working with people, right? I feel like there's such a separation, and and I get lost in it too with with what I do day to day. Where like I I do forget sometimes. I'm like, oh, like all of these purchases we're marketing towards these are actual human beings that are like taking time. This is like every every tick I see on a sales report is someone's huge decision to spend money, right? And like. I, th I think there's a huge disconnection and, and I would assume that at the Wall Street level, like there's so much of that that you forget that these data points are all human beings and the, every dollar somebody worked towards, whereas scaling on the government side, you're still looking at small businesses that are, you know, founder operated in a lot of cases. So there's a lot of skin in the game. Yeah. I mean, and to your point, like that's it, right? Like spreadsheets, numbers don't lie. At the same time, mm -hmm. they don't give you context for the broader decision or what impacts will happen if you mm -hmm. do X, Y, and Z. And if you don't understand like the nuances, especially in the industry that I specialize in, then you that's where you lose. That's where you lose mm -hmm. money effectively. So the, the, the yeah. correlation back to, to drifting and car setup is really interesting too, because like um, just sitting in the spotter's tower, which is, I mean, if people don't know, you have a, a ton of spotting experience as well, um, which I definitely want to get into. But like, you'll hear the arguments back and forth between drivers and spotters about um, lap time and then like car feel. And it'd be like, hey, like you're actually up time wise. And like, yeah, that's great. But like, I don't like the way this is feeling like I'd rather pull the car back a little bit and then and and work with it that way than to just just push on the numbers because the numbers might be faster but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to do what I need to do in the in the long run. 
I mean, I would say the fastest lap times in drifting means you are way off on all the outer zones, right? So, yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> you know, a good point. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's I use the numbers for a way to compare, you know, which cars are going to be faster and which ones like I need to tell Kazia like, hey, make sure you don't get lost in the start on this one because this guy is super, super fast versus, hey, this guy's three seconds slower than everybody else. Like, just make sure you don't like slam up onto them in like at the first turn because then you end up losing because you choked got choked up so mm -hmm. that's that's where it's helpful i'm not as concerned about oh did you do the best lap time because again especially like irwindale or any other place that there's just a lot of outer zones if you have a fast lap time it means you're off the zone so yeah yeah there, there needs to be I mean, as you said, numbers don't lie because the fastest lap is going to be the fastest lap. But as as I tell a lot of people, like one number um, is not is never going to be correct. Like you need context. You need like any data point needs at least one other data point to to verify or to correlate with for it to make any sense. So as you said, like you might have the fastest lap time, but if your line score is way off, if that's our second data point, that first one doesn't matter. And it actually indicates that it's something bad, not good. Yeah, and that's the thing with spawning that I took a little bit of a different approach when I was um, when I was in there. And I guess full disclosure, I'm no no longer I have retired from spotting for oh, this I didn't year. Know that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Damn. Okay. <laughs> so it just became too much to try to drive and spot at the same time. It was just tons yeah. and tons of work, and so it's just better for me to just pivot and focus solely on driving. But it was a really great experience, and uh, I really loved working with Kazia and Jerry over the past two years doing it. But I did take a different approach in terms of, yeah, I was sitting there with my laptop. I think everybody else is still pen and paper, very old school. And I'm like, dude, I can't. I'm like, my handwriting's terrible. I wouldn't understand what I'm writing. They were trying to read back my notes. So that's why I have an Excel spreadsheet and, and plugging in numbers, typing in notes. And then when I wanted to fill out my bracket, actually, it's, people started looking at my stuff because I would be able to sort it in about three seconds versus trying to determine which qualifying scores you know did what do you know what i mean <laughs> yeah so yeah uh, i get i'm literally thinking of the pivot <laughs> table you could build to do that like <laughs> yeah no i built something that's really fairly automated i just had to plug in the scores and then sort it automatically and then meanwhile somebody is just w either waiting for fd to give you the bracket or manually trying to sort things that's like well hmm. yeah there's just uh there's you know times change and it's really easy to sort through the data there the spreadsheet that i have quickly versus trying to go through pages and pages of notes over a weekend when you could just sort by whatever whatever data point, right? And you could rank it that way. There's so much that you could do. And well, you could, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's what I do. Like when Kazita tells me, hey, I'm going up against, uh, you know, Vaughn or somebody, I just look, I go through sort, I, I'll isolate all of Vaughn's runs that I have recorded and I tell him, like basically I summarize them in my head and then I communicate what I want him to do or how I should, or how he should think about going up against uh, somebody in particular. Again, the mm -hmm. other way around would be, okay, which, you know, I have this book, where are Vaughn's runs? Like you can't, I can basically yeah. turn around and tell him something within five or 10 seconds. Otherwise you're going to be searching in the notebook for a couple of minutes. And then at that point, you know, the runs probably, he's already probably at the front of the line. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. I, well, the funny thing about this, like the first year I spotted, nobody really had a laptop. And then the next year that I spotted that I start to see more laptops in the spotting booth. So you know. I think it's the way to go. I, I really do. I mean, even if you just looked at like, oh, you know, can we look at like any d a data correlation? Like, could we could we sort by sector one time and then we realize, oh, it's all the same tire or something. And then you look and like, but sector three, that same group is like actually really slow. So this tire is, you know, whatever it's 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 popping off too soon. These guys are cooking it really early. And then by the end, it's a problem. So like, hey, they're going to gap you in sector one if, if you're going up against, you know, whatever tire. They're going to gap you in sector one, but don't worry. It's going to lose all momentum by the end. So you're going to be able to catch up. Like, like stuff like, dude, stuff like that just nerds me right out. Like, that's that's the kind of <laughs> shit that I absolutely love. I, I mean, yeah, I might have to, like, steal some of your notes from from last year so I can start running this. Sorry, man. It's proprietary. <laughs> or you can pay ah, me. <laughs> uh, hey, I mean, listen, listen, I think uh, I think we sell enough uh, toques. I, I might be able to buy that data off you. So. <laughs> yeah no, i mean that's know. interesting i i like that man i really do i think that's i think that's kind of the future you know we, we look at so many other motorsports and the amount of technology that's around it it's it's actually kind of silly that it's taken us this long to start using laptops to be able to even just sort run data yeah and i feel like we're still at the very like entry level of of data 
consumption and analytics in drifting. Like if I look at F1, they have that whole, Ugh. they have a whole position of the chief strategist and engineers looking at the stuff. Like they can, hey, the car doesn't feel right. And they have like sensors to immediately tell what is going on or mm -hmm. all that stuff. And um, I, I have no idea how it really works um, because I'm just on the outside looking in, but I assume it's really high tech and really cool. And maybe drifting will get there someday. And that would also help inform car setup because sometimes I feel like we're just kind of <laughs> shooting in the dark <laughs> with with stuff and just like hoping it works and then it happens to work or, you know, it doesn't. And then you're kind of back to square one. And if you're a team that has a lot of resources and can try a lot of different things or they, you know, you do that well ahead of the round, then you kind of come in with the car preset for the most part versus, you know, smaller teams or even, you know, rookies. Just it's a lot harder to try to find the right setup because you don't have any past data to work off of. And then, mm -hmm. you know, again, shooting in the dark sometimes trying to figure out what works and then continuing to build off of that is just kind of that's how that's how drifting works right yeah yeah I, I do agree i think i think we're at a point too where even just like the cost for some of that technology has come down where it is obtainable like tire temperature sensors right like they're, they're not they're not cheap but like they're at a point where they're not f1 level where they're you know a thousand dollars for a tire temperature sensor you can get them for a couple hundred bucks now, plug them into your display and know when your tires are in the optimal temperature, you know, in the burnout box or suspension potentiometers to like actually see how much travel you're going through if you're bottoming out and you, you don't even notice it, right? Like we'll, we'll get to a point where that is all very, very common practice in, in all the cars. And then what's, what's funny though, is like you look at something like Odie's car where like, there's not a lot of sensors on that thing. It is just, <laughs> it is just a man and a team that just absolutely understands what's going on on a guttural level. And his brain is the sensor in the computer. Yeah, I was going to say, there might not be a lot of sensors, but there's a lot of math that goes yeah. in there. So yeah. I, you know, I think he's a really smart guy, engineer, driver, really great uh, business owner. I mean, he's uh, someone to look up to for sure and has clearly figured out a formula that, that works. And it seems like he can stick anybody in one of his cars and they do super, super well. So, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I am curious to see how much technology we we get in there. I know Matt Field's implementing more. Obviously, you know, the Papadakis crew has implemented more, but uh, RTR has got a ton. So it's like I, I, I do think we're we're very close to seeing a myriad of sensors all over these cars. Um, it's just like at some point sensors break and then you still have to go back to gut feeling. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, only a problem when the sensors break that are, you know, related to, you know, coolant or something. Because if that yeah. coolant sensor breaks, then it's shooting everywhere. That's maybe that's happened <laughs> to me before. Uh, I was going to so, say, yeah, you've, you've seen it happen before firsthand. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I really have to thank my team for um, for saving me so many times over the years. Like, especially, I mean, Jerry, especially, because that happened last year in Atlanta where, you know, you had a coolant temp sensor fail on the engine and, you know, they're in between battles between top 16, top eight or something. And I'm just kind of in my zone as a driver. Just I can trust them completely to solve my problems for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would just be pretty worried. I was like, I don't even know what's going on, but I know they're on it and I can trust them to give me a car ready for battle when the time comes. And so, yeah, but like it can be a scramble and sensors when sensors fail it can be a little bit more than just, hey, gut feeling and it works well. Yeah, except yeah. when you see the water shooting everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of those that like has its own indicator, like a, a physical indicator when there's a problem. I mean, so does like oil pressure, but the problem is, uh, you know, late, the, the indicator is not a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if you see low oil pressure, there's a very, very rare chance that you're going to be able to save that. That's that's the tough part. I mean, you can shut it down quick, but man, yeah, yeah you got to hope. I mean, by then the rods already exited the block, right? So... Yeah, but, it's got another indicator. Depending on yeah. which way it exits, <laughs> you might get the the same experience. So, yeah, uh, yeah. I um, I want to kind of like run through your drifting career. Like you, you talked about seeing drifting for the first time. Uh, it looks like you you kind of got in fairly early, end of high school, kind of caught the bug and and went from there. Um, what's what's that path been like? Yeah. So started two thousand seven. Saw my first Formula Drift event because of a trailer for Tokyo Drift. And then video option uh, was, those are the two things that, that's how I found the sport. I've always been into cars from a very early age with Speed Racer, grew up in the 90s, so NASCAR and, and that kind of thing. But 
that was that was kind of the first step into drifting. And then the summer before freshman year of high school, I broke my ankle skateboarding at Woodward and had a couple of months of just sitting on the couch and then found US Drift, which is mm -hmm. actually the series that I ended up winning my pro license at eventually. But they had a spec they had a Pro Am competition. I was hopeful that Formula Drift would return to Summit Point and they still have never done so after yeah. that 2007 event, which <laughs> understood, can uh, totally understand why. But anyway, went there with my broken ankle and then started seeing it and it was like, I want to be involved even at this grassroots level, but I was 14 at the time. So I picked up a video camera and used that to barter for a ride along. So I would shoot you know, videos create these kind of skateboard-esque type videos where I was mixing like a song together with a bunch of shots, kind of making it look like a skateboard video. And then that progressed into doing Formula Drift actually as a media person when I was 15 or 16. I handed, I just, you know, don't, don't ask, don't tell how old you are, I guess, and in the media vest and that kind of thing. Days are a lot different back in 2010, 2011, 2012. Yeah, a little, yeah. little more tight now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I started racing or drifting when I was 16. I bought a bone stock BMW E30 and took it to the track. And then as I was able to buy better parts for it, I was, you know, just kind of upgrading and going to the track kind of once a month back then throughout high school, helped build a roll cage in it, did a 1J swap in it eventually switched to an S14. Then I drove most of college, still have that car, it's a stock 1J and it's been like that forever. And at some point I realized, okay, this is really hard. I'm DJing, I'm bartending, I'm driving the drunk van around college uh, to be able to make enough money to put two tires in the car. And I don't have any money to like do anything else. And it was really frustrating. So that's why I decided to pursue that career in finance that allowed me to I knew it was going to be a brutal grind. So it was 80 to 100 hours a week, sometimes seven days a week for months on end at times. And it sucked. But at the same time, it set me up on a path to be able to afford my 86, which is what I used for Pro-Am. I had committed service brand in Delaware build that car for me once I left banking in 2018. And by 2020, it was done. And that's when I started testing it. And that was a week before COVID started. So there was that. But... Thanks to Chris Knapp at E-Town, was able to test the car every other weekend. By the time the U.S. Drift shootout came around at, in October of 2020, that's when I ended up winning the entire event. And that's how I got my ProSpec license and then have competed in ProSpec since then, 2021 to now. So, Gee, yeah. that's a, I mean, it's a wicked synopsis. I mean, you like skipped through like all my notes, but we'll get back to that. <laughs> um, I do, I do want to touch on the, the shootout thing because like, I've been pretty vocal against it. Um, I believe you, that's how you got your license. So like, not that I want to like start a fight. I just want to like hear the other side of it because my opinion has always been, it's great that we can do the shootouts. I, I do think it's, uh, it has its place, but my concern is always um, it doesn't develop a team and it doesn't develop longevity. And every time I bring that up, someone's like, yeah, what about Nate Chen? Like you're like the exception <laughs> to that rule and the argument that I always get back. So like, what someone coming from that, like, what is your, your thoughts on, on shootout licenses? I understand why or where they originally came from. I did a decent amount of a season in 2014. Yeah. I say decent because I don't think I hit every single round. Again, this is back before I had even budget to really even do any of this stuff. But what happened towards kind of the end of the season, only the handful of people that were maybe in contention to get a license would show up and then you so you'd start off a season with maybe 32 40 cars by the end you're down to like 10 that and then it just was hard to run an event that way and so i mm -hmm. think the organizers of pro-am events were saying like let's just try something else let's try the shootout type style because you know the people that are probably going to finish very highly at these events are going to end up being the ones that can actually go to the next level and I think, you know, there are trade-offs to both a series and a shootout. Yes, it's more cost-effective. Like, it only took me one event, and I, frankly, like, got lucky. I didn't think I was going to win. Like, I was hoping I was going to do really well, and then just circumstances just, you know, uh, driving did well. I didn't lose once, and there was a double elimination thing. And so, yeah, that was uh, an awesome night for myself personally. But... Overall, it has shown inconsistent results in terms of not every 
shootout running uh, same type of rigorous judging panel or having the same caliber of drivers or only having a limited field where you don't get stiff competition. I would say being on the East Coast, we actually have just great drivers and great programs like Club Loose and US Drift building the best drivers uh, in the country. And so because of that, that's why we end up getting really competitive drivers that make it to Formula Drift and, and tend to do well. So, I mean, obviously, Forsberg, Bond, Turk are like the originals from, mm -hmm. from Club Loose. And ProSpec, I mean, you have Alex Yeager, myself, Dimitri, a few others that regularly go to E-Town as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's... And the reason there, the secret sauce is just that, you know, it's Jersey. They uh, they tell it like tell it to you like it is, right? So yeah, I've gotten it too. Like I've been on the receiving end of, hey, dude, you have a car, but you're you know, your driving sucks. So fix it. And I'm I I'm cool with that. I firmly believe in open and honest communication. And even though I don't wear the jean jacket and fit with that culture necessarily, I love I love how the again the honest feedback is is very true. It's not personal. And some people shy away from it, but I think you just, you know, if you can't have, don't have thick skin to embrace criticism, then you shouldn't be drifting on a competitive level. So yeah. anyway, so that's what Club Loose does. They give you a nice tiered structure of, you can't just go out and drive the full track on your first day. You have to earn it. And I mean, you really do have to show that you know what you're doing in order to get to the A group eventually. And that's why, again, they build people, they want People come want to come back. They want to progress, and then you end up getting people that make it to Formula Drift if that's what they want to do. But Club Loose themselves, like they actually don't like competition. That's not their thing. They just want to drive and have fun. And at the end of the day, that that's what I want to do too. Like I like driving non-competition events, but for me, competition really brings out the best in me because that's that pressure and that drive to win is what motivates me to to drive my best. Do you know what I mean? So. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do like the tiered system at events like the A, B, and C. I mean, it it really allows drivers to want to progress. Like it, it gives you a goal to get to. And even when you get into the A group, then it's like the push to be like, you know, the biggest show in the A group. Like the guy throwing down the the craziest lines or smoke or whatever. So I do I do see a lot of value in that. Um, I originally came from like an open we just went out. It was hot lapping the whole time. There was no run groups. You just did whatever you had to do. And it had its benefits and its drawbacks. Like the, the nice thing was like, if you had a problem, you know, you could go back and run at any time. But the drawbacks were that like, you get some of these guys that would come out who are, you know, top tier A quality that didn't want to run because there's a bunch of C guys spinning out in the middle of the track. So like, yeah, I, yeah, I, did, no, I, totally, I can I, see both sides, but yeah. No, I'm totally, uh, yeah, I've, I've, had, I've definitely experienced both of those and the putting the C guys out on the same track as the A group, that's really annoying. I don't like that. I mean, yeah, it, you know, I don't care if you feel bad that you suck because you're in C, you have to earn it to be on A and that's when we can be on the same track together because I don't want to wait for you because you're spinning out. Like, I don't want to sit in line. I just want to drive with really good drivers and I know when I go to Club Loose and A group, I can trust everybody there even if I don't really know them that well that I'm going to put it on your door. Like, I'm not here to for practice to play it safe or do solo runs like i'm here to simulate what a real fd battle is going to be and that's how i'm going to drive which means i'm going to put it on your door every single run that i can <laughs> and there's not going to be any you know go i mean yes i will go easy especially on some people that i am maybe questionable yeah. about but that's not i don't want to do that i want to just drive as hard as i as i can and and i am i think i'm pretty good about you know playing it safe to a degree like i'm not trying to run people over or straighten up and smash into people. I, I really do just want to be kind of in that pocket. So, yeah. Yeah. And you need to have an inherent trust, right? Like that's the, the nice thing about knowing everybody in a, like you have a, a good understanding of like, okay, this is how close I can get. You can learn a little bit quicker, like who you can tandem a bit harder with than other guys. And there's just like an inherent knowledge that that's how it is. And I mean, I've seen it too, just even with like FD guys at different events where you might still have like an A level person, but then you've got the FD level person that's in there as well. And there's the same thing. There's a, just a different understanding of how hard you can push with that driver. Right. I, and I'm sure you've seen it too. If you show up there, there's another pro spec or pro level driver. You're like, Oh, like, I know I can, I, as long as you have that conversation, you know, don't just like door somebody because they're a, a pro, but you know that 
if they're there, like you, like I can drive hard, I can really push this and, and see what we can do to, to learn and, and get better. Yeah. And it's been interesting kind of seeing that evolve over the years. I feel like now when I go to places like I'm not pro, but people know that I drive in formula drift and et cetera, mm -hmm. and they just, they want to chase me or yeah, they would just want to chase me. They don't want to, they don't want to do lead runs because they're too afraid that I might hit them, even though <laughs> I want, I'm not going to hit you. Yeah. So I'm just like, all right, come on. No, this is a give and take. Like, yes, I will do a lead run for you to chase, but at the same time, I expect you to also let me chase you down. So I think, I think too, there's something when you get to that higher tier of, of driving with people that are at a, a lower level, if you will, like understanding how to predict their unpredictability. And I, I've heard a couple of the, the top tier pro guys say that they've, they've learned by driving at these other events, these non FD competitions, how to drive against guys who are like maybe entry into pro, right? Cause like, you know, if, if you decided, you know, oh, okay, I'm going to go to long beach, there's a huge learning curve coming in a prospect to pro. I, I, there's, you know, there's no way around it. You can be the absolute goat in, in prospect, but when you get to pro, it's a completely different level, but there's still pro guys that have to drive with you and tandem with you and compete against you. So not only do you have to know how to drive against Osbo and Vaughn and these like absolute maniacs, but you also have to understand how to drive against drivers that are rookies who are, you know, not as familiar with the long beach and not as familiar with a, a 295 or 1200 horsepower, right? Like that's, you, you really need to have that entire arsenal to be a, a really, really good pro level driver. Yeah. And I would say this jump from pro am to pro spec is equally as uh, brutal, you know, in, in terms of the, where yeah. the top of the field and the bottom of the field is in pro spec. And <laughs> that's something that I've had to kind of learn over the years where a couple of years ago, you know, my spotter would say, you know, just, Hey, give this guy a lot of space. But then yeah. more recently in the kind of the last couple of events, it was, Hey, you're going to have to drive against somebody like this in top 32 anyway. So you better just chase them and learn how to do it safely and not you know, risk your car, but at the same time, don't give them like a five car gap because you're just not too sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you just have to feel confident that, you know, your reaction times are going to be su uh, sufficient to be able to avoid anything if, if something bad does happen. But for the most part, I mean, I would say almost the entire field can do a lap without spinning or, you know, whatever. And if they straighten out, like that's still, you're still going forward. So it's, Mm -hmm. Even if it's harder to chase or they would lose automatically in a battle, it's it's workable if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, you've I, I I would say you've you've shown that knowledge too. I mean, just looking at your prospect records, you run what it's three years, so twelve events. Um, yeah, four top eights, two top sixteens, top thirty two. Like, it's not like you don't know what you're doing. You've you put in the time. It's just like now it's honing that craft and, and getting to the point of, 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 you know, moving up. Like, is that where you're at going into this season is knowing like, Hey, I've got a good base. It's like, if I want this pro license, this is what I need to do. Yeah. I would say every year has been a really significant progression. You know, first year finished 19th tied with five people, second year finished 11th, third year finished eighth. And each year I can see my driving improve. I think I posted a video somewhat recently of showing my English town qualification score or run or whatever from the three different years. And you can see just massive progression every year. And so this year I'm obviously coming for the top three spots to be able to move up to pro. But, uh, you know, I, again, I'm kind of coming in with just this attitude of building on what I have built over the past couple of years have the RX-7 demo car is a great practice car that's similar enough to my FD car, but it's, um, you know, not as expensive to run. <laughs> uh, so I can use that a lot. And that's been really helpful. In the past, I didn't really have anything like that. And that car didn't really come online until maybe halfway through last year. So I just am trying to set myself up for success the best way I can, which is to try to eliminate chance and just do my homework, right? The sim, the sim was something I started last year. Helps me improve a lot. I mean, Atlanta was a great example of that. I had never driven that track, qualified second. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's huge. And that's such a, I mean, that's such a scary track. Like, it's just, I love it. That's my favorite. It just yeah. blows really nicely. There's actually not very many walls to hit. No. You can't, you can't hit the wall, but 
it's fun. I just, I, I think it just kind of goes back to also my personal driving experience of growing up on courses like Summit Point, mm-hmm. DIR, English Town, all big, yep. fast road courses. And that's exactly what Atlanta is. So it kind of feels like home. And I love driving there. Can't wait to start round one there this year. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I, I do love Atlanta. Um, I'm always curious with that, like when you talk about growing up on the road courses and then how that correlates to banks, because like we have drivers that almost only know bank tracks or, or ovals who then have to come into road courses and we have the opposite. So um, I assume you didn't have a ton of oval or bank experience oh, before getting in. Did but you? I did, yep. Okay, where, where were you driving that was, that was bank then? So a couple of different tracks. I had Old Dominion Speedway, which is gone, but that was the first place that I started okay. driving. Actually, that was when I was borrowing people's cars. I actually borrowed my first spotter's car when I was 15 and then proceeded to wreck it. So um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a bad wreck. I think I like broke a wheel or something, but you know, it was, uh, yeah, so some... yeah. <laughs> so there's that one, there's Shenandoah Speedway, there's Wall. I got to drive Wall in, oh, in okay. Pro-Am. Yep. And I won my license at Langley Speedway, which is Noble. And I think those are the main ones that I had experience with before coming to Formula Drift. Okay. Hmm. I, yeah, I, I wasn't aware that you had, had driven those. I mean, I should have called Langley, but uh, yeah, it's, I, I feel like it's just such a, a, a big difference between the two styles, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's common things, but there's also such a difference when you get up onto a bank, the way that the car is is hanging in there and what you need to do to to hold it onto the wall, right? Well, it's also a big mind shift uh, from, you know, in grassroots stuff. Like not a lot of people are putting their bumper up against the wall and then in FD, everybody is. So it's mm-hmm. also, yes, I had some of those experiences and I had put my bumper on the wall Specifically at Wall, I remember there's like a really great picture of my S14 right there um, on the wall. And that I think honestly was by accident. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, I mean, it not really. Like, I remember telling myself, like, I need to floor it into the first turn. Otherwise, I might as well pack my stuff and go home because I can't be a little wuss about this. Do you know what I mean? So, um, but, you know, driving FD is just a whole another level. Irwindale, that is one of my favorite tracks to drive. Got to drive it in 2021. Also wrecked my car pretty bad there in uh, in competition, but that wall in that bank is is crazy, and it's not something that I had experienced. So I was probably one of the few tracks where I, I believe you actually do need, you know, six or seven hundred horsepower or more to make it through the track, and anything less than that, you're not going to be able to stay up on the bank, and mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's tough. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a good range. I mean. I'm always interested to see what tracks we could add or remove or whatever. And I mean, there's always a constant discussion of like Orlando and taking that out of rotation. No, is yeah, it, take is it there... out. Kill it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kill it. Kill, Kill it. the fire. Uh, is there's something, there is something like weirdly nostalgic about it and, and something about like how much it sucks that it kind of brings everybody <laughs> together. <laughs> Look, I mean, obviously I'm a numbers guy and I understand the numbers and the financial aspect of it without yeah. knowing the full details. I can just, I can see it doesn't take a lot to rent that venue. And I'm sure the people that manage the venue, I don't have any problems with them, but it's not well set up for a professional racing series to go to. Yeah. No, I think, I think that's fair. And this is the most apolitical way you could put that. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely got some stories about seeing some last minute repairs at that track. So yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just, it's, I mean, the track surface is one thing, but ultimately what we do in motorsports and drifting is we're entertainers. And Mm -hmm. I don't think we can put the, our best foot forward at providing an entertaining show at a a venue like Orlando. When you contrast that to a, a venue like Long Beach, which is, I think one of the coolest things ever being in downtown in the middle of a city. I love cities. Clearly I'm sitting in the middle of one. Right. But having like this backdrop, but in a racetrack, like that combines two of my most favorite things in the world in one space. Do you know what I mean? And so Orlando is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. There there is something about like, you know, you coming from the media side of like the ambiance of what's around the track and the, and the, the media and the content that comes out of it and how that portrays what the sport looks like, right? Like you do it in Long Beach, the photos that come out of Long Beach makes it look a particular way and gives it a, a particular credibility. Um, same thing with like Utah, right? Like 
there's something about that track that just makes it look incredible. And then as, as you know, you get to Orlando and you're like, oh, okay, <laughs> like that's, we're here. So yeah, I, I do think there's, it's, it's almost like dressing for the job you want, not the job you have, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it goes back to kind of, you know, maturity levels of businesses and et cetera. And at one point, you know, I think Orlando was more than a fit for FD at the time, but I think we've grown as a series to, and have matured beyond it. And so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see events like, you know, more events that uh, are like Drift Masters, like that stadium thing where they sold out 50,000 tickets or whatever. And yeah. was it expensive? Sure. But was it cool? Yeah. Like the pyro and all of that. Again, when we talk about what what is our main objective uh, as a series is it is to entertain. We are in, mm -hmm. I could, I consider us no different. Um, If you, you know, we're trying to attract people that have things they could do during the weekends. Like they could go to a comedy show, they could go to a concert, they could go to a football game or baseball game or whatever. I mean, I guess whatever major sport thing is like, that's, yeah. that's who I compare us against. We're not just a motorsport thing. It's, we're, you know, would you rather go to the movies or would you rather go to formula drift on a Friday night? Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. again, if you want to have something that is compelling, then I think you need it to be visual. And I like the, I like the fireworks. I like the, stadium aspect of it. I think having things closer to cities obviously would introduce a whole new crowd and um, if public transport, if you can get there with public transportation, that that's a plus, but you know, it comes at a cost and it's not lost on me that that is part of, part of it. But at the same time, it's one of those catch 22s. Like, do you want to scale? Well, you have to take a, a decent amount of risk in order to do so. And if you don't take that risk and you don't scale, you know, then you're dying, right? Like that's mm -hmm. at least the, that's the way I view businesses. You're either growing or you're dying and there's no in between. So pick one. That's a good take. I, I dude, I'm, I'm down for more street circuits. I think it'd be <laughs> sick. I think there's enough. I think there's so many different street races um, or street circuits. I don't want to say it's like street races, but like enough street circuits on the calendar from other events that we could find ways to adopt to. And I know like it's a complexity because now you're working with another promoter, another event series, but like, it can definitely happen. It's just, it's a time, it's definitely a time and money it's thing. It's a time right? investment. It's a coordination. <clears throat> I mean, there's so many parties involved on another street circuit, but trying to leverage other existing infrastructure and relationships, you know, yeah. more Long Beach type stuff, or again, inside stadiums, you don't have to get any real permits for that other than yeah. maybe construction and that kind of thing. But I think there's a way to do it. And I'm very hopeful that we'll see that more in the future because that will ultimately allow us as a series and also as a driver and team owner to, to just scale, right? Like that's, yeah. we just, we need more. We, I want more general audience members. I want to see, you know, people that are there for some corporate meeting. They didn't spend any money to be there, but they spent money with somebody to be there. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Or somebody spent money yeah. on their behalf. Like I, I go to those things as, uh, at my day job, like I go to these baseball games and stuff where I barely watch the game and I sat in some really expensive seat, but I didn't pay for it. So yeah. why can't those people exist for formula drifts? Yeah. I, I know I, I brought it up previously, like as a, as a Toronto Maple Leafs fan, like, um, you go to a Leafs game and the entire lower bowl, the best seats in the house are all corporate. It's all suits up in the box seats. It's, it's literally meetings while a hockey game is playing in the background. It's like, as a fan, it can definitely suck, but there's a reason why the Toronto Maple Leafs are arguably the he most heavily funded team in the NHL. It's because they they sold to the corporate crowd. Like, you know, I I, I feel like a broken record so often on this show, and I feel <laughs> bad for people that have to listen to me make the same point over and over again. But like, Salesforce sponsoring F1, right? Like, how how tempted have you been to like pitch your program to like some of these corporate companies where you're like, listen, you lose. Like in, in rounding of numbers, you lose more money than I need to run my program. <laughs> like, like, you know, like from like office space where like we take like a, a, t a one thousandth of a, a percent and we're still millionaires. Like that's got to run through your head at, at certain times. I'm sure crossing those two worlds is not corporately responsible, but I'm sure you've thought about it. I mean, to an extent, maybe I have, maybe I haven't. Um, I would say... Even for a business like Salesforce, the ROI has to make sense, right? And so of you course. have to basically show them, you know, hey, we're reaching this many people and this many people of your target audience. It's not just volume, it's quality as yeah. well. And I do want Drifting to be there. Like, I think we have the most visually exciting product from a motorsport standpoint. 
actually like I, you know, I don't think there's an argument for it because again, when you add stuff like pyro, you add all these visual effects from a pure entertainment standpoint, I think it's the best. Um, and therefore if we have the best product and we're maybe not mature at marketing it or making it or selling it to as many people as possible, then that's the part that needs to improve. But if we have the superior product, I think it's easier to get the marketing side done or at least more tangible and more feasible. Um, right. So at some point, like I think those larger companies will see the value if we attract the right audience, if we're at the right venues, if we have the right price points and ambiance and all the stuff that goes into uh, making an event great and not just focused on the driving. Driving's great. That's one part of it. If you go to Vegas during F1, there's a bazillion different parties and they all are sold out and they all have like this crazy stuff going on that has nothing to do with the race. <laughs> but that's why it's successful is because there's this mystic and awe of, of all the other stuff that goes on and it's not just about the driving. And just like even running a racing program, it's not just about the driving. Like it, it's really not like doing stuff like this. This is a skill in its, own, in its own. And I don't think everyone is really on the same page in the series that they fully understand it. I think obviously the people that have been around for a long time do, but newer people, newer drivers, even people that I see in Pro-Am and coming up, like they just, I don't think they full, see the full picture of, of what it means to be a Formula Drift driver. I, I You bring up a, an interesting point with that. Um, and this is, like, I mean, I, I'll, I'll do a little bit of a call out here. You're the only pro spec driver that has directly approached me to be like, hey, how can I get on the show? There right? you go. Like, yeah, there you go. I mean, I've I, had, did, I didn't had, know that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, it's, and it's not like I was pushing away anybody. I've had like the, I've had like the informal, like, oh man, how do I get on the show? And I'm like, hey, yeah, just get a hold of me. Like, we'll work it out. But like, that's as far as it went. You actually, I don't even know where you got my email from. Got it from somewhere. I got from you your got business my... card. I got your business card at some oh, point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, I had to you, take like, it you, out of my pile. Yeah. But, yeah. but you, took, you took the time a couple months ago and, and we worked it out and we timed it with a partner announcement. Like, sorry for like everybody like to show you how the sausage is made, but I think it's important for any of, because a vast majority of the people that listen to this are people who want to get into this, this series or, you know, just want to understand this part. It's like, that's how this needs to work. From your perspective, you're like, hey, I have a new sponsor. It would be great if I could have a place that I can promote that sponsor um, and and line it all up that way. And like, you know, it's no secret you did uh, the other drifting show before this as well, which like great episode as well. Uh, nothing but love for, for that whole thing, like no competition here. Um, but you strategically lined up things to do that. And like all the drivers should be doing that. I should have an inbox completely full and i'm having to manage who's going where and all that stuff and it's that's not unfortunately that's not the case and i think it's just an education thing uh i really do look a bunch of you use this code all 2023 let's keep that train rolling so if you are looking for some awesome fd apparel different stuff you know things to buy maybe it's not for you maybe it's for somebody else might as well save a couple of dollars so when you're on shopfd.com use podcast 24 just the you know podcast numbers you know podcast two four at checkout save yourself 20 percent. and uh yeah if you do let me know just, just if you see me in person give me a high five say hey thanks for saving 20 percent. maybe online shoot me a you know just shoot a note you know where to find me links are in the description all that stuff if you feel like stalking me or just letting me know that you save some money so shopfd.com podcast 24 save yourself some money i agree and look i play to my strengths i know this is something that i am hopefully decently good at. And I got a lot of positive reinforcement from the last podcast that I did where I said some things that may be controversial or very opinionated yeah, and polarizing to an extent. But at the same time, it, it did create a lot of people talking and et cetera. And so leading into that, when I quickly signed that deal with S-Tech, which it stands for Shield Technologies, actually, they make paint protection films, fashion films, window tents and car care products. Um, really interesting company that's been around since 1977. They were the first to market with a paint protection film that's not vinyl. Um, so it means it's hmm. hydrophobic, thicker, self-healing, looks better, and it's more durable and comes with a 10-year warranty versus a three-year warranty. And so I was just, again, was really excited to sign this really big partnership that means a lot to me personally. And I didn't even promise them this I, at all, but I knew I wanted to do this in the background. And 
Um, and then I emailed you and of course you were like, yep, let's do it Wednesday. And I was like, oh, I was scrambling a little bit, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but S Tech was awesome and turning around and delivering me, you know, a hat, this awesome shirt, a couple of other things. Yeah. So I was just really happy that everything pulled through and it's a great way to kick off this partnership because they're going to make my car look super cool this year. We're using their Dino Prism product on both the 86 and the RX-7. And what it does is it gives this like little like metallic uh, flake and like this kind of like reddish tint over my iconic blue. That is kind of my branding, my color. And it kind of reminds me of some of the cars that I loved growing up. Like the Signal Auto Skyline is probably my dream car. And it has that really cool reflective multi-color shifting paint. But that stuff is like impossible to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if the company is around that makes that anymore. And this is a really cool new piece of technology that's come out more recently that you can get a very similar effect and make your car look really cool. So I'm really happy to have S Tech on board this year. Yeah, that dude, that's that's sick. And I'm 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 glad that you're like not just utilizing, but like you're it sounds like you're incorporating the product. It's not just like, oh, like here's a roll of film. Like it's like, no, we're gonna put it on the car. And I mean, just like you driving it and banging the hell out of it is going to be a testament to the product, right? Like that's that in itself, like if you take the bumper off and you pull it up and you're like, hey, this looks beat up, but understand that like under this, my paint is fine. That sells the product, right? Yep. And like, you know, marketing brain on, like that's that's what I would do. That's an ad. That's a perfect ad is literally just like, what? Because it's going to happen. Your bumper is going to come <laughs> off. It's going to fly through the air because it, it does. It's going to hit the ground and scrape it at 60 miles an hour. And then, you know, cut to you holding it up, peel off a section of the paint underneath is fine. Cool. That sells X amount of units at a 20 row as right there. Like, great. That's, you know, like that's a good partnership. That makes sense. And it's not a company that's, as far as I know, has been in FD. Correct. Yeah. This is their first foray into Formula Drift. I actually found them at Fuel Fest and they did support a kind of pro-am level driver before. And I think that exposure to drifting and the visualization of of drifting, again, most superior motorsport product there is, right? From a visualization standpoint, I think that helped them understand like, hey, this could be a cool avenue. And, you know, talking with them about, you know, different content pieces and things we could do together over the past couple of months has kind of ultimately led us to having full support from them this season. And so, again, really happy to knock it out of the park for them this year. And then hopefully that will lead on to multiple years in the future. That's sick. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm, I'm really interested to see how that's going to look too, with the, the kind of the red over blue, um, with that prismatic look, I, I have a feeling I know what you're talking about. Um, that's, that's, that's going to be sick, dude. Yeah. Have you, have you like demoed to like understand what it looks like yet or just played around with it at all? I've seen it in person at, you know, at the, uh, the event that I went to last year, but I haven't gotten my hands on the film yet. We're actually going to do a uh, shoot, uh, with AZ rag is going to be oh, the cool. installer for the, the product. And we're doing that sometime in April. So that's when I'll get to really see and feel the product itself. But I've seen obviously a lot of their, um, their footage and how the hydrophobic qualities are, are really cool. You just like, it gets a bunch of water and you can immediately just kind of like wipe it off. And um, yeah, it's it's going to be, again, really awesome and unique to to bring to the sport and excited to have them on board this year. Ho- hopefully they can do like a windshield wrap of some kind too, just like with the, because it's going <laughs> to rain, like it, it always rains. So like yeah. that would just be a huge benefit. <laughs> Yeah, no, it totally, totally would. And they do have some really cool products. I haven't tinted my windshield in the past. Uh, I guess, you yeah. know, having street cars, you can't, can't really do that, I guess. Um, and then in yeah. racing, you, you could. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, they, they make a lot of really great products. And I think, um, again, they stand out in the marketplace just being a superior product as well as, um, you know, unique in terms of you're not only protecting your paint, you're also making your car look really cool. So yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that combo. Um, so like switching gears a little bit, are you able to give me your top three cocktails? I know you're a cocktail guy <laughs> and you got some experience with it. I went through your little, <laughs> your like COVID posting scheme of, of some interesting things. Um, yeah. give, me, give me like top three. They could be obscure. They can be classic. I don't care. Okay. My favorite of all time is my own recipe called bittersweet symphony, which I think you might've found through my yep. Instagram post. And so that is a gin based with simple syrup, lemon, bitters, green chartreuse, St. Germain, which is an elderflower liqueur. 
And it's a really, the way that I just would describe it, tasting it's, um, you know, it's just a really good balance of having high alcohol content, but it doesn't feel like you're drinking that. And it is just, again, everything is just well balanced together. The St. Germain, which is elderflower liqueur, is very sweet. So is the simple syrup, but that's balanced out with gin and the green chartreuse. And so, yeah, I love, I just, hey, just like building cars, like I love building drinks too mm. in building businesses. Like it's just really fun to, once you understand what, like, um, what combinations of flavors there are and to mix them all together and to create something that, again, tastes good, but doesn't feel like you're killing yourself. Like that's what I enjoy drinking. And so that's kind of the ethos that I take to building all of my own cocktail creations um, from a recipe standpoint. So I like that one. My classic that isn't, you know, I, I only have this on occasion now, but it's the mojito. I taught myself uh, maybe a little younger than I wish I should have been <laughs> <laughs> how to make. But that was all because of uh, James Bond in Die Another Day when Holly Berry's like coming out oh, of the okay. ocean with this like red hot bikini or whatever. And James is sipping on this like gorgeous looking drink that has a bunch of mint in it. And then he's like, mojito. And I was like, all right, that's one day I'm going to learn how to teach myself how to make that. And so that was the first drink I learned how to make in undergrad. And so, yeah, that's probably my my second favorite. The third, I love French 75s, especially variation of French 75. So it's a classic Prohibition era cocktail. And what the variation that I do, I think I took from uh, a great cocktail bar in New York called Death & Co. Well, they're originally from New York, they actually have a location in DC that I'm a big fan oh, of as well. Sick. Yeah, we'll have to go sometime. I love cocktail yeah, dude, bars, speakeasies, just somewhere that I can have like an intimate conversation, actually talk to somebody. That's that's what's fun to me because like I enjoy talking with somebody, not just standing at a crowded bar. Like that's, right, and yelling. that's yeah. yelling. Yeah, already, I mean, we're we, already like we've actually been deaf. there and yeah. done that. Yeah, we, we've yeah, been there yeah. and done that together. <laughs> so so I'd love to like show you like, yeah, feel free to come out to DC sometime. We'll have a great time. I'll show you some of my favorite spots. Yeah, but, um, I'm but uh, yeah, so anyway, French 75, it was named after World War One artillery cannon because if you have a couple of them, you feel like you got hit, hit by the French 75, I guess. So it's okay. uh, gin, lemon, simple syrup, and then my variation of it is gin, hibiscus syrup that I make, and then lemon, bitters, Saint Germain. So, mm. and topped with sparkling wine, both uh, in both versions. So, oh, that'd yeah. be good. Nice, super good. Nice. Yeah, I'm a, I'm much more of like a rum drinker over a whiskey drinker. Um, they, I, I had a little while ago, someone made like, a, I mean, it was it, they called it an old fashioned, but it was basically like a banana foster kind of rum old fashioned. It was really interesting. I think I made um, something like that once, actually. Yeah, that was and one that's of what the, like the triggered it. Story, yeah. like, <laughs> I saw that and I was like, oh, shit, I had something very similar to that recently. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I, I'm always just a fan of like anything somebody just puts passion into. Like it doesn't have to be alcohol. It doesn't have to be anything else. Like uh, I, I enjoy cigars, but not like I don't smoke cigars constantly, but I, I enjoy understanding that somebody worked really hard to create something and then getting to enjoy that. That's the process that I like. And it doesn't, I mean, cocktails, food, whatever, cars, like that's the thing that always just gets me excited. And especially if it's something I know nothing about, like there's nothing more interesting than, than consuming something and and then researching it at the same time, right? Like I don't know if you do that, but like I'll I'll buy a a, a rum or a whiskey or something. Know nothing about it. Just ask somebody like, hey, is this good? They're like, yep. And then while drinking it, like have Wikipedia up or something else. I'm like <laughs> sipping. And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know. Like this this farmer came from this place and went here. Like I don't know. It's 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 kind of neat to understand the history while experiencing something at the at the same time. No, I totally totally agree with that. And I would have to thank my uh, a really great friend who's also named Nate from I met him in New York and he kind of taught me about how to refine kind of my cocktail crafting because I in college I was a bartender and I was but I was making high volume gin and tonic yeah vodka sodas etc like as fast as you can as many as possible sours. yeah <laughs> yeah no that's that I was probably not on the menu at the bar and we were oh, okay. mostly a beer bar I don't know so I was just pouring fast and then kind of making my fun cocktails on the side but he kind of opened my eyes in terms of researching bottles or in terms of like, Hey, instead of, um, thinking about it as rum, like, why don't you smell this bottle of Bacardi superior and you smell pineapple? Okay. Mm -hmm. So think about what else would work with pineapple and how you would influence that flavor combo or pair it with something else that would go well with that. And so again, I, I don't know, I love sharing 
my passions with people. I love making cocktails for my friends that come over. And I think it's just really fun. Like, I don't know, it definitely has like an air of pretentiousness around it, which is stupid because I think it yeah. just tastes good. And yeah, it requires a little bit more effort than pouring a beer or something. And I, beer is great too. Uh, I won my weight in beer actually at the US Drift uh, shootout <laughs> that I did. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I won my weight. They actually, but I don't weigh all that much. So they just, they just gave me like, I think everything that I had. And then we just <laughs> shared that up against everyone. So, um, uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, no, cocktails are something that I really love sharing. I love sharing my passion for racing with as many people as possible. You've seen the halftime show in, in person and getting to able to share, share that skill set as well. Just hyping up crowd, entertaining. Like, I think that is, that's ultimately what is fun for me, you know, being able to entertain people in some shape or passion, you know, shape, shape or form, whether that's race car driving, DJing, bartending, like that's, I think that's, I don't know, I find that really fun. Yeah. I mean, you, you obviously have a very, I wouldn't say carefree. I don't think that's the, the, the correct word, but like an exuberant personality where it seems like you, um, you know, kind of get some energy from the attention. I'm the same way. Obviously, like I have to have that to be on a podcast and you know, <laughs> I have to enjoy the attention to some regard in order to do this. But like, you know, similar, like looking through kind of like college days and stuff, you know, you were, you were active, you were doing things, you were, you know, golfing in your boxers, you were you oh know, my God. promoting, <laughs> you know, promoting film festivals. Oh, like, I mean, you were out there doing shit. Um, you had crazy hair in high school, which I still think you need to bring back. That shit was <laughs> that shit was awesome, dude. There was so much volume. I was like impressed. Yeah, um, really but yeah. but it it you can see, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like looking back, you can see that path of, you know, fast forward to standing on top of a trailer with a megaphone and and throwing gear at people. Like that's not a, it's it's not hard to understand the path from from that. Um, yeah. And I would say a lot of that I owe to DJing and that's how I became comfortable with crowds because naturally I'm at, I actually am kind of an introvert at heart. Like I do like to keep my friend circles pretty small. I don't have time to just like keep up with tons and tons of people all the time, especially given my schedule and et cetera. And I do kind of recharge by just being by myself. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. that juxtaposition has been really interesting because even when you were, even when I was DJing, I still felt like I was kind of in my own little world because you're a little bit removed from the crowd, just like being up on stage in at the GT radial booth. Like I, and they're amongst a bunch of people, but at the same time, I, it's almost like a different feeling and then a different kind of game that you just turn on in terms of just being able to be comfortable and being vulnerable. I think that's the biggest thing is being able to be vulnerable up on stage, be real with people. Um, and not like freaking out that you're, you know, on stage and a bunch of people are watching you, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so just having that comfortableness from DJing all those years in, in college, which by the way, is probably the funnest job I'll ever have. <laughs> um, that's just made me again, like super comfortable with, with crowds and, and it's something that I love to be able to display out on the track. I, I do want to set up an evening where it's like you, Osbo and Sage all get time and like do a set because um, I've, I've, I've experienced Osbo DJing, which is incredible. He's really, really good. Um, I haven't obviously you and Sage yet, but I, I think that's something that needs to happen that like, I'd love to back you to guys back. build the set. Yeah. 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 Back to back to back sets are awesome. Like I would do that sometimes with a friend that I actually taught how to DJ in college. And the thing was like, when I was in the middle of DJing, I would never pre-plan my sets. Like that was the fun part of it. Like mm. every, like two minutes before a song, I would mix probably every two, two and a half minutes per song or that's how long i would let a song a single song play and i would have no idea what was coming up next and Dude. i would just listen again based on ear actually these are my my headphones from djing oh uh, nice yeah so anyway so i would just you know wing it and that was so much fun because it also kind of creates a little bit of a panic in you when uh you're like crap i literally have no idea what's playing next and i better play something because otherwise it's going to be dead silent but we'd love to do it back to back to back with uh ryan sage and osbo i think that would be super super fun we should totally do it at uh at fd and just create yeah. a big party yeah i i was love finding like the correlations between drivers and like the similarities and i mean this one this one ties in um music seems to be a common thread as well i would like to know who you would like to put in your formula drift acapella group 
as well. Um, <laughs> Acapella. I, I don't. I can't. I can't sing. I never said that. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen. I've got videos of you singing with a group. I just. I mean, it wasn't solo. But oh my god, that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if that was like uh, serenading the dean. I know that was a, a, no, that was serenading other freshman hall. Group. There was like this whole tradition at William and Mary in order to like try to create camaraderie and introduction to your freshman year. You end up like the guys' halls would serenade the women's halls, and okay. it was like a you know you do something awkward to put yourself out there, and then afterwards you like have you like I think you as a entire group go to one of these freshman orientation type events, and so we sang. Dude that what was it some uh jonas brothers song or something i don't remember yeah, but yeah i can't, I can't remember, I, don't remember. I, I was listening to it today what? but uh, i couldn't, couldn't remember what the song is. it might it might pop in later yeah no uh, I'm, I'm much better just behind the behind the decks <laughs> dj and that's that's where uh that's where i excel <laughs> did you uh did you do the william and mary traditional triathlon as well wow you looked that up yes i yeah. did i did you did Wow. <laughs> I will, I will so, leave that. Okay. No, I, it's okay. If you, right. you want to for, say it. All yeah, right. <laughs> I will say it. All right. So for anybody that doesn't know, the William & Mary is the second oldest institution in the United States, right behind Harvard. And yep. there's this triathlon tradition where you are supposed to streak the Sun Gardens, um, jump the governor's wall, or uh, governor's palace wall, and then skinny, or I guess jump into uh, the Crimdale, which is this gross looking lake thing. And so... Everyone does it, you know, freshmen and senior years <laughs> is mainly it. And the Sucking Gardens, by the way, is like a football field length of real estate. So it's it's not a short walk. And I, I remember <laughs> going there once, like when I did it, I was like, oh, cool. Like nobody's here. I'm all good. And then I got, you know, 80% of the way there and saw a couple people and was like, oh, hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> Just me naked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it seemed it seemed like a cool school, man. Like I like researching it. It's it's, it's seems not a, neat. It's okay. So that maybe sounds a little too too much party. Uh, it, it's pretty then, serious. And then, and then I'm talking about yeah. how I'm DJing. Yeah, it is. It is uh, not not like that at all. It was the opposite of a party school. It was a really small 6,500 undergrad at the time when I was there, and it was a really great foundation to just build myself as a person. College isn't about necessarily trying to walk away with um you know a specific degree sometimes like for me it, it was it was okay like i want a finance degree and that without that finance degree i would have never made it to wall street right but i think the other part of college and why it's so valuable to live on campus and have that experience is it just helps you grow as a person at a really pivotal pivotal part of your life where you're you know a young adult not really fully figured it out yet and for some people you know, it's hard and they, they don't actually make it through all four years. And then others like, I mean, I, I did obviously, but <laughs> again, it just, it allowed me to grow a lot as, as a human being. And it was got, it was a really well-rounded education, um, where I was more than just the fin finance stuff. I didn't actually take business school classes until junior year. And then I got Dude. to do things like the film festival, which was really, really cool. Got to meet Michael Sarah through it actually once. And, uh, he's just as awkward as, you know, I he is. Yeah, yeah. Just he's yeah. like the, I don't know if he's that that would be insulting. He does act, but at the same time, it's you know, he's kind of the yeah. same person on on screen as he is in person. So anyway. Yeah, the same yeah. way Jack Black acts, where it's yeah, just like, yeah. okay, we're just gonna need you to be you, but say these words. And that's <laughs> yep. the movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, so. it's um I I mean I did one year of culinary school. That's it. Like I, I lived in a college town for a bit. So like I kind of got to have the college experience before and after as well. Um but yeah, for me, I mean, it was it was definitely an experience of just like living on your own with another group of people who are living on their own and nobody really has a true understanding of how to feed themselves. Um, so like, <laughs> exactly, you know, I, had a, I had a good way of doing it because I was in culinary school. Um, so I was definitely the person who had to feed my entire, you know, group <laughs> of uh, house, if you will. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the important part of, of post-secondary is less about the actual schooling more about the the relationships and camaraderie that you you build with it. And that's what's going to stick for you or with you forever. Like, I don't remember yeah. a whole lot about very specific, like, history classes that I took there. <laughs> but living with my best friends at the time in a way that we could go get lunch every day, that's just something you don't get to enjoy as an adult, right? And yeah. to anybody that's, like, kind of watching this in high school, like, I highly recommend just doing super well in school. It, again, if you have more of an aptitude to do, you know, more technical stuff, like that's awesome too. 
as yeah. long as you have a good career path and, you know, college is one way to do that. Um, but it just, again, builds you as a well-rounded person. And if you go to a really good school that has a great business school program like William & Mary, that's literally the only way I would have made it onto Wall Street. And even that was hard. Like I had to network my butt off in order to just get a <laughs> shot. I was reaching out to like 60, 80, 100 people, telling them my story. It kind of sucked at first. Like I wasn't very good at, you know, telling people why I should, you know, get a shot at this really intense job. And it was just something I had to work at and busted my butt to get into. And um, I mean, the drifting works the same way too, though. And like, and that skills, again, everything I've done in my life has kind of built one upon another and has enabled me to get to the seat today. And, and I know the route that I took is not necessarily the most popular or I haven't seen too many other people do it, but it's helped a lot. And I think it gives, it makes me, you know, unique for who I am. Well, I think, I think people just see the end result, end result, right? Like, um, it's, they, they see, they see where you're at. They very rarely see where you came from. I mean, um, like today, like to, you know, to tell people like today was the day that like my announcement came through of me doing the announcing shit. And they're like, there was a core group of people that reached out and messaged me that like, have known me for over a decade that understand that like this announcement is, is the culmination of 11 years of doing shit. And one guy put it really well. Um, my buddy Alex, and he's like, yeah, he's like, there's only a few of us that remember, you know, the videos you used to make that got six views. And I'm <laughs> like, yeah, you're right. Like those still exist somewhere like that. You know, maybe they got 50 now, but like, it's, it's very easy for people to, to look at a situation and just be like, Oh, cool. Like, you know, this guy got here for this reason. They don't, you know, they don't get to hear about you putting out a hundred cold calls to get to Wall Street to set yourself up to do this now. And they don't know what you're doing now, right? They just see, oh, this, you know, some young guy with this crazy ass car driving for Jerry Yang and, and all that stuff. Like, oh, it must be nice. And it's like, you know what? Sometimes it is kind of nice because for a long time, it wasn't very nice. Like <laughs> that's, that's the hard part. It is. And congrats. Uh, oh, apologies you. for like not mentioning that earlier. No, no, uh, no, I no, saw the announcement good. and now I'm thinking like, well, now you really get to feel the fire because once people really, I mean, not that you haven't been seen before, but now you're on mm -hmm. another level and I'm sure you get a lot of hate. I mean, I, LA, I've seen it and it's, it's tough. It's really tough. But to your point of people not seeing that, like, yeah, no one saw when I talk about DJ and no one saw me DJing behind my dresser for my freshman hallmates could pretending I was like a beachy or something, you know what I mean? Or, <laughs> In race car driving, they never saw, no, people forget that I had a bone stock BMW E30. Uh, With a they ton of body roll. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, those yeah. photos. Oh yeah. Exactly. Like, they didn't see the struggle. All they see is, like, the 86 and uh, LRX7, <clears throat> and they're like, wow, this guy's, you know, he must have daddy's money. I don't, but you can call me daddy. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. I'm so stealing that. That's great. So, um. I do want to see the free hug sticker make its way back, though. That oh was, that was great on the BMW. I think, yeah, I think you need to yeah. put that back. <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. Yeah, that was a friend of mine, Yoshi, who we stuck that on. That was like our team thing back then was we put free hugs on all of our rear windshields. And, you know, that car was up for sale recently. Um, oh, really? It's in a really sad state. It's a shell. And it's oh. like covered in soot. And it's in Baltimore, Maryland, though. So um, I guess somebody could buy it for probably the same price that I paid for it as a running car. That <laughs> <laughs> so it probably has like yeah. your signature somewhere on it and just like hidden away and be like, oh, this is Nate Chan's. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> Let's go back and buy it again. It'd be fine. You know, with if, all, I had, all... if I had a limited time, sure. Uh, yeah, it would be fun. But it's just, uh, yeah, I have I have enough like on my plate as is. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough to juggle all the time, man. Like I, I get it. Um, I, oh, I don't know. I don't know yeah. how you're doing it now, but I'm, I'm like so far behind actually in like my personal life. I was getting just cranked at, you know, both careers that I love dearly. But at the same time, I didn't do things like go to the doctors or find <laughs> where I'm going to live because I'm moving out of this place that I'm here in two weeks and I uh, haven't signed a new lease yet. So Bro. Where, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, you know, it's sometimes like the most effective way is to operate under pressure and fire drill your life. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, very much understand that feeling. I've I've had those situations here. I'm like, oh shit, this is something I definitely needed to do two weeks ago, and here we are. But yeah, fire drill your life. I like that. <laughs> it's it's true. I mean, sometimes you need to be able to operate under that pressure, and I think people don't experience that enough, and and or don't know how to cope with that. Right? Like, I think 
one of the one of the best parts of having a really high intense shitty job is you very much learn how to work under pressure under severe scrutiny under you know whatever terrible conditions it's terrible at the time but like i've learned more life skills working in some of the most atrocious kitchens that you could ever imagine like people literally throwing knives and pans but like coming out of it i'm like dude throw anything you want at me i can handle it like i could take this you know old portuguese guy literally throwing pans at me all night like you want to yell at me that's fine like you're not going to get to me it's it's great so. Yeah, that's crazy. Like culinary school to four wheel drift announcer. Like that's definitely a, a new one. It's a long story. It's, a, it's <laughs> one day I'll break the whole yeah, thing I'll down. Like, but you should yeah. have your own episode. You know, like <laughs> someone interviews your, me. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, happy to, I'll interview you for, for an episode. It's, I, I just, yeah. man, I just get obsessed. Like that's honestly what it comes down to. And, and you can look at any of my hobbies over the years. Like I used to run, I ran concrete plants for seven years. I knew nothing about concrete. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I yeah. operated oh, like you need your multi- episode. Okay, somebody, yeah. right? J, uh, J Rod or Ryan, like somebody has to do an episode. Someone's got to do the research. Yeah. I mean, it's it's honestly, if somebody wants to, it's all on Facebook. <laughs> I didn't. There's there's a lot of shit on Facebook that I should probably go down <laughs> and take off. But uh, uh, yeah, I'll be all right. I mean, I, mean, I, same, I do think because you, apparently you found a lot of stuff that, that it was. On. We talked about it before the show. Yours was yours was definitely uh, tougher. Um, none of your yearbooks are listed online. Your school didn't do a very good oh, job of like thing? keeping records. Oh that yeah. Be, oh, I didn't realize Dude. there was yearbooks online. Wow, I didn't. Oh yeah, I find I find a lot of shit that way. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, no, yours is yours is pretty good. I, I I don't know if it's it doesn't look like it's been scrubbed. You were just very careful all through. You know, maybe like senior year of high school, you're like, eh, I gotta be. It's gonna keep an eye on what goes on here. Yeah, I mean. That's true. I did have kind of that mentality to an extent. So yeah, there's nothing it's like super good. embarrassing on there. All I do, no. you find in my campus golf, uh, that's the, <laughs> that's the, way of, what was our team name? It was like no pants in international finance was our, yeah. <laughs> cause you like dress up into the wacky costume and then hit and around the golf and boxers on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you knock around a tennis ball, it's not even a golf ball around, uh, the Sutton gardens, which, mm-hmm. so you're not really playing golf, but it's just like a fun experience uh to share with your friends nobody nobody ever checks the photos they're tagged in that's that's the real trick mm, yeah gotcha. your friends will tag you in stuff that you forget about so that's fair yeah, i think like in high school you were listed as like you remember those like pages it'd be like a post like you know tag the emo person the punk person and and for some reason oh. you were tagged as the dead person i don't know oh, why yeah, you're the know. dead person but yeah. i think i know what you're referring to but i have no idea why uh, Oh, you know what? Maybe it was because freshman year, that's when I, I started off high school with a broken ankle. And so I was mm. on crutches. So maybe that was that was it. That was tough, too, because okay. I went from a small school to a big public school and I didn't know anybody. And I had a broken ankle, you know, and uh, okay. on crutches. It was just a rough time. That's is it, So did you move then or were you like you were always in Virginia? You just like moved cities? Always, or? No, I always lived in Virginia, but I went from like a private school to mm-hmm. public school. And so... Oh, okay. Public school typically kind of feeds up, right? Like everyone that's or elementary, yeah. middle, whatever. And then so that that was the only reason why I didn't know anybody. So um, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. It didn't seem like you're in too big of a, a city, though. It seemed pretty. I live small. Thirty minutes outside of DC mm-hmm. in a town called Vienna, Virginia. So mm-hmm. it's a nice suburb, great place to raise a family. I could see myself living there. You know when I'm ready to die, I guess, but <laughs> take the, take the grandkids down to see the the caboose in the, in the park. And there you go. You know, yeah. Check some concerts at Jam and Java and yeah, wow. it's, a, it's, it's a solid weekend. You definitely did your research. Yeah. I took like <laughs> drum lessons at Jam and Java. Uh, yeah, that's hilarious. That's, yeah. that's so funny. I don't so, know if you knew this, but, uh, the, the famous writer and, and now podcaster, Mike Baker, formerly of the CIA is from your hometown. Huh. That's yeah. not surprising. I mean, I, driven past the cia a bunch of times <laughs> so i went to school there like it was pretty close to there so um i've never never seen it it's it, you can't really see much it's as you would yeah. imagine kind of highly secure and blocked off so yeah yeah i could i could see that yeah yeah i mean it's not like they had big glass windows and you know easy for snipers so i'm sure that makes sense um yeah. yeah i also i also found out that your high school was actually the uh villain high school at the very end of remember the, remember titans. the titans that's yeah. true very true. Yeah, that was kind of neat to uh, dig into. It's a, a and our football team, movie. the football team was never that good ever again, or at least when I was there. So <laughs> kind of <laughs> peaked, peaked in the mid seventies, and that was about yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Uh, no. So what's uh, what what is the plan for this year? Like, obviously, we talked about a couple of different sponsors and a couple of things changing that way. 
Um, any other like big updates or is, is just, you know, this hopefully the final push before pro. Yeah. Hopefully this is the final push before pro. I, again, it's just kind of building upon more of the same one I've done the previous year, really working with partners to expand kind of my service offerings, um, that will compared to things that I've wanted to or I've done in the past. And there have been a couple of milestones that I want to achieve, like being able to offer a full turnkey marketing turnkey package on something again, outside of just the racing stuff, but mm -hmm. looking at other programs, like look, look at what Vaughn does for his partners, right. And be able to offer something similar. I've finally found um, someone really great on the marketing side to partner with in terms of being able to deliver a professional package uh and thought out like a well thought out <laughs> marketing campaign that has deliverables etc so i mean there's a lot of new stuff on the business side from that standpoint because again if you're not growing you're dying so that's been exciting for me to work on obviously in the off season and then during the execution part of the year continuing to really focus on key events obviously formula drift is the most important thing to me right but then there's also you know the hyperfest the grid lifes that kind of thing having that rx7 is again tremendous and mm -hmm. So I would say it's, again, a continuation of everything that I've done, but like, let's just amp it up another level. So, yeah. So let's say everything goes well, you get your pro license. Like what, what do you work on first? Like, let's say, you know, last event, you know, you're getting it. What do you, what do you start to do right after that to get ready for that jump to pro? I'm not trying to like put the cart before the horse, but like, you definitely have your shit together. Like no offense to any other driver, but like just your education and schooling and general mindset, like is, is business forward, you know, drifting is a part of that. So I'm kind of curious from your perspective, how you would, would tackle that as a problem. I think the biggest hurdle after obviously the result side of things <laughs> is the partner side of things. Right. And so that co those conversations need to happen well before the last event of the season. If I'm, well on track to heading there and so i guess okay great i'm on the i have the license cool what does that mean well it means cool. i should have yeah i should have no i mean i should have already talked to people at that point and should have hopefully a good visibility of like hey you know um and i, I have kind of communicated this <laughs> is the plan for partners right of like hey this is this is the direction i'm going in this is what i want to be doing I want people to be able to scale with me and here's what is coming with no like definitive like obligation from them. But it is just like, Hey, like I expect if I perform for you, then you will allow me to do more for you by doing pro by doing other initiatives that I would like to execute upon. And, you know, this year is just a proof point for a lot of these new partnerships as well. It's just like, Hey, let's, you know, take this example here's like what you're getting and here's what I know I can deliver if I have more resources. So from that standpoint, again, it's the partner side is the other side of the equation that has to be solved in order for me to actually go pro fully. Right. And so it's eight events versus four. It's a significant increase in budget. And then also crew has to, you know, get organized again. That's a lot more time commitment for, you know, than the current, commitment that I have from an awesome crew as well. And so, yeah, there's just like a lot of juggling balls and that kind of stuff. Um, but that's, you know, that's natural. Like I, as, as you know, I like to fire drill my life. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, I can't imagine what that's like, or even just like facing the prospect of it. And I think there's a lot of, of different ways that it can be handled, whether it's, you know, uh, like we had Derek Madison on where it's like, he's just, he's just trying to figure it out as he's, as he's figuring it out. And there's definitely people who are very analytical who would like roadmap it and make projections and build out those those marketing and media packages. So I'm I'm just trying to understand from I like to plan a lot. Yeah. I like maybe not but like okay, even Formula Drift has been a 10 year plan for me. Right. Right. Um I you know when I had that epiphany, hey, this working three job thing and putting two tires in a car is not enough. I need to sit here and think what can actually get me there. Right. And so does that mean I have like a very detailed plan that took place over these 10 years? No, but there's a general direction and understanding of, hey, I need to do X, Y, and Z in order to achieve this. And right. Hey, I love Derek. Love you, man. But dude, I don't, I could not just like ride by the seat of my pants and expect things to work um, because, yeah, I've tried that sometimes and it, it hasn't worked. <laughs> so, I mean, 
Uh, so look, I, I think again, does it mean you need a highly detailed spreadsheet to go through a thousand different boxes in order to be sure that you're going to be successful? Like, no, but having a level of understanding in a direction and under, and okay, I, I know I need X, Y, and Z. And so if I want X, Y, and Z, then work backwards to figure out how to get there. And so again, I would say like, look, I love taking risk, um, but it is very calculated risk. And so it's not just kind of a, well, let's see what happens, um, you know, when it comes to higher level decisions in terms of just where is my life going? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, well, I, people need to set goals. Like I know it's such a woo woo sounding thing. It's like, oh, you got to like manifest it and stuff like that. And it's like, well, yes and no. Cause like, if you think it, if you believe it, if you breathe it, you are going to consciously and subconsciously work towards it. So it's not just like saying like, if I tell the world I'm going to be a millionaire in five years, that it's going to happen. But if you say to yourself and you, you make that a goal, there's a much more, you know, it's, it's a substantial increase in possibility that you're going to be because you're thinking about, about it. it, you're talking about it. Yeah. yeah, it's all about accountability. And a lot of people are too afraid to be accountable to even themselves because yeah. what well, yes. failure, et cetera, whatever. No, yeah. I mean, I, I'm happy to admit when I'm wrong, I'm happy to say, oh, look, I actually did not make my goal this year. Okay, why was that? What do I need to do to fix it? What are the mm. steps that I'm going to take to make sure that I'm successful this time around? Because as much um, success as I've been fortunate to have in both drifting stuff and the day career, like it hasn't always been just very smooth. Like there have definitely been rough patches in both. And it's the, re the rebound and recovery and persevering piece that has allowed me to keep going, right? Otherwise, I could have just given up and quit a long time ago. And for anybody that is in this position or wants to be in this position or, you know, whatever, like they've all had that. I mean, way better drivers than myself, like Vaughn, he's totaled cars. And yeah. how do you, I mean, how do you come back from that, right? Like that's really tough. That's really expensive, but he did and he's fine. And and James Dean is special. I mean, I, I know he's kind of on the same team. They're on the same team now, but... Um, you know, you can either pack it in and give up and go do something else, sit at home and watch TV every day instead of going after the thing that I know I've been passionate about, will always be passionate about and will have some involvement in for the rest of my life. And it's already been more than half my life. And so, yeah, I mean, why not go for it and be again, accountable and set goals and, and all that type of stuff. So, yeah, I, yeah. the the difference between you and you know, some people listening is you didn't give up. Like you might have failed. You might have actually given up. I'm sure there's times in, in your car career where you're like, I'm not going back to the track. I'm not going back in the garage. I'm fucking done. Like that's <laughs> it. But then at some point you went, okay, never mind. No, I'm not done. Like I need to go back. I, I do need to do this. You know, it's like that meme where the guy throws the paper in the air and then he's like, actually, I do need these. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the difference between you and, and some people listening at home is that you got back in the garage, you got back on the track and you started doing it again. There are, don't take this the wrong way. Um, there are probably more talented drivers sitting at home that just gave up. Like, no, I like, and I don't take offense to that. I don't think I'm the most talented driver. I don't think I'm the most, the smartest person at all, but I just work really hard at everything that I do that I'm very passionate about. And that's how I make it a success. Right. Yeah. And that's where if I'm willing to put the extra hours in that, you know, somebody else is in, that's the difference between, between me and them. Yeah. Yeah. Any successful person you speak to, like the common denominator is perseverance. Like that's, that's it. They, they come from different backgrounds and like some start easier than others, but almost all of them just kept going. Like nobody became successful by giving up. Like that just doesn't, maybe Jimmy Buffett, he was successful because he just kind of was like, I'm just going to vacation and make my career out of vacationing. Um, well, hey, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of work it's to lot do of work. all those tours and whatever. Yeah. Being a rock star isn't, isn't easy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> hands be killing him from squeezing, squeezing That's... citrus all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, I mean, the man. other big thing with those guys is it's also the people that they surround themselves with. So when yeah. I look at even, you know, Papadakis or Vaughn or Odie, you know, it's not just those guys that made themselves a success. It's all the really talented people they have around them that can ultimately build their programs or their businesses into what they've become. And it's tough. It's tough to like recruit that talent. Uh, you know, I mean, you kind of need a level of success before you're able to do that or be able to piggyback off of, you know, a platform that's already there. But yeah. 
it's uh, it's never nice when you hear someone say like, oh man, like you've changed. But like most of the time when someone says that, it's it's a good thing because you've you've progressed on past wherever they've decided to stop. I mean, I'd hope so. Like yeah. people grow as a human being, therefore they change, right? You grow smart. Yeah. And if you're not getting smarter, or you're not learning a new thing, or you're not becoming better at something else that you're doing, then if you don't change, then you're just dying, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, I don't exactly. keep saying that. No, but, but, it, but it, like, yeah. it correlates to a lot of things. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, constantly moving ahead is not easy. Um, and you definitely, you know, you're going to learn more from failure than you are from success. Like, even with a car, if something breaks, you're like, oh, cool, that broke. I know I need to fix that. If you have a perfect run, tell me exactly why it was perfect, right? Give me the exact thing that made it perfect. You have no idea. Like you, you can't, it's everything worked. Okay, cool. Like, what did you learn from that? All right, let's make sure everything works. Like that's, that's all you can learn from that kind of success, unfortunately. But if I mean, was fails, it actually that perfect though? Like that's the other thing that I right, think people tell right. themselves, oh, like I killed it. I killed it at driving this thing. And then I look at the run and I'm like, Dude, you like blew off all the zones and you straightened yeah. up. So good job. You killed it. <laughs> Besides you know. a handful of 100, po 100 point qualifying runs, like, which is an improvement. Then, yeah. 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 Exactly. And, and I mean, look at like JTP. Like, I mean, I think he's had two, he had two 100 point qualifying runs. I know he had a couple 99s, but then, you know, never won a championship. Right. Yeah. I mean, like, if you win qualifying, you don't actually win the, the main event. So exactly. It's, it's really and, hard. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, one of, one of the best qualifiers ever in drifting, one of the best single run drivers in drifting ever, but never won championship. So it's like, you can be perfect then, but you need to be perfect always. Yeah. But, I don't yeah. know. I mean, to even to that end though, he had a really great career and I think oh, he, yeah. uh, yeah, definitely did super, super well. And if I can get to where, you know, do everything that he did on just a little bit more than I, be pretty happy with with that so like he's he's like a driver that drove for himself and just did not give a shit like that's that's how i felt like his driving was and it just happened to be that it was a 100 point qualifying run sometimes whereas it's like he just didn't care um great guy I've, I've had the chance to chat with him a few times and and very 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 interesting man um but just does not seem to care and i think that was like his superpower and that's why he drove so well it's a mental game for sure. And that's where I struggled with a lot uh, last year towards the second half of last year because of, um, well, I was closing the deal, uh, ETEL was closing the deal at the same time as St. Louis. The first time that's ever had those both worlds conflict at the same time. Right. So that was miserable because I was doing three jobs at once that week. I was doing my day job plus spotting plus driving in 100 degree heat. And it was, uh, yeah, just to not go well. And then I never really fully recovered in Utah either. And then I think I got sick during the middle of Utah. So that was, uh, that was really tough. But again, it all goes back to mental game. Like I know I physically have the capability to drive super well, but you know, sometimes it just doesn't always work out that way. And that was another thing that I've been working on in the off season is just trying to build a, a better mental game. And, you know, basically with the help of a coach, uh, effectively is, um, is the way that I'm trying to solve that problem. So again, being honest with myself of where I've failed in the past mm -hmm. and, and doing corrective actions to make sure that it doesn't happen again. It's super hard to put that ego, like to stare that ego in the eye and be like, I'm a failure at this thing or I'm not good at this thing. Like it's, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, I have to do it with even the show. Like I, I do read almost all the comments and people complain about things. I'm like, no, you're right. Like as an issue, I do say interesting far too often or I do whatever. And I have to go, okay, try not to say that now, like make a mental note not to, to do that thing. And, but that's, you know, how I've been trying to get better is take those complaints and see if I can eliminate that issue and move forward. So I, it sounds like you're doing the same thing with the mental game. And, you know, for me, like I'm not a audio engineer, so I brought one in, like not good at balancing audio. I've never been good at it. I don't have the ears for it. Mostly because actually, believe it or not, JTP uh, broke my eardrum in Atlanta while I was filming oh back in God. 2019. His wow. car backfired. I was filming at the, the flagger stand at the bottom of the hill. And I have the footage of it too. I was panning. And as I was panning, his car backfired as I was coming across. And it was like at my ear. I did not have hearing protection. Oh my yet. God. Oh, and uh, that's... I, felt, I felt it go. My ear started bleeding. And I was oh like, oh my God. Wow. Oh yeah. No, it was, it was not a good time. So I, I, I've got a pretty substantial amount of hearing loss in my left ear. So that's, 
I mean, that's my excuse as to why I can't balance audio. I wasn't very good at it before either. So <laughs> oh, that's totally fair. But, and going back to the thing where, you know, you need to surround yourself or like, you can't just do all, even in drifting, there's so many different roles. It is a team sport from that perspective. You can't be the, your own crew, your own crew chief, your own spotter, your own driver, yeah. your own business person, your own transport. You know, you can't do all of those things at once. Your own car builder, fabricator. Nobody can do all of those at once and be the best at every single one of them. I think there is division of labor that you just have to understand where your strengths are and where they're not. Car building is not my strength. Have I done it in the past? Yes, I've helped build my own roll cage or bend my own bars on the roll cage. I did not weld it. I have welded my own exhaust together, was not the best. Did it get, you know, the tr car got on track. Okay, great. Um, do I maintain my RX-7? Yes. But like there are certain things where maybe I'm not the best at it. Um, and so that's, again, where a partnership with somebody like Jerry has been really awesome because he can give me a reliable car to drive and has improved upon over the years because when he got it, it, it did not run very well. <laughs> and, and now it has. And even Jerry, you know, partner with tuner Jojo Callos, who, again, even towards Jerry's strengths, he's not a tuner, right? So that's where you have to bring in all of these people to make one car work. And frankly, it's a fraction of the people that are working on F1 cars, right? Like, doesn't Mercedes have a thousand people for two cars? Like, oh, it's pretty not. insane. Yeah. So we have like a handful for, well, I guess, you know, the three car team that is, uh, that's Jerry Yang racing this, this year. So, hmm. well, yeah, just know what you are not good at and find somebody who is. And like, I mean, you, you know, this with, with scaling and that's what mm, business is too. Management. Yeah, yeah. That's all businesses. Like yeah. know what you suck at. I know your weaknesses and find somebody who's really good at that weakness and bring them on and, you know, pay them a bunch of money to, do that thing that they're good at like that's but at the same time by paying them that money that allows you to do things you would not have been able to do before so exactly that's where it goes back to the catch 22 right like you yeah. can't can't have one without the other yeah that's yeah, tough well we'll figure out all of life soon maybe on the next episode <laughs> i don't think <laughs> all of life sure yeah i don't think that'll ever happen but no yeah, we can at least have fun along the way right yeah exactly i think i think the next episode we do we got to do cocktails everyone's been like Hitting me up. I, I mentioned that I wanted to yeah. do a podcast with Adam, like cooking. Okay. I, I think this like cooking, traveling, drinks thing, this this might turn into a thing. Yeah. So come, yeah, dude. I would love to make you a cocktail in DC, do a bunch of fun things here. Like it would be be a lot of fun. And you did like in your invite, you did say like have a drink ready. And I was like kind of like debating. It's <laughs> like, oh, I was like, is that is he's like, I was like kind of sitting there like, oh, but then if I you, yeah. if you want to, I mean, here's the thing. Not everybody is super comfortable coming on these shows. And sometimes I have to warm them up a little bit. And if they get, you know, some liquid courage in them, I find it goes a bit easier. So yeah, there's nothing totally in fair. this though. We're good. It's like it's just water. I actually don't even okay. have a coffee on the go, which is a shocker for me. It's seven o'clock at night. So <laughs> oh man cool um anything else you want to cover i i mean we're already like an hour and 40 in it, it goes pretty quick <laughs> yeah no i mean i i think i have covered pretty much everything i want to yeah. want to say again big shout out to s tech for coming on board this year morosa performance fuel lab ngk spark plugs wiseco haven't really fully signed that yet but they i think are on board and so get really excited to have kind of those newer partnerships. Although Fuel Lab has been a, a partner, but has recently stepped up their investments. So we're doing more together, which I'm really excited about. And then nice. continuation of partners, you know, in Koenig, Koenig Wheels, Clutch Masters, Fortune Auto, and Buddy Club. And um, yeah, so just really excited to have everybody continue to be on board. And, you know, again, stepping up investment in, in both vehicles has just been really, really great. Um, you know, I'd only use the best parts that I can on my cars and ones that I know are super reliable and just great overall quality. So yeah, luckily just again, really fortunate to have the program and the support from people like obviously my parents, uh, for, for raising me and, uh, Jerry Yang, my spotter, Charlie Tyson, Hannibal Jameson, who's been there with me since, um, shootout, but a lot, a lot of people to thank. And again, this is a, a team sport team effort. Can't wait to see where the season takes us and looking beyond of course to the to the future years as well so thank you so much jacob for having me on the podcast and now i'm the only prospect guy apparently to reach out but <laughs> <laughs> so 
I so, have a feeling uh, I'm going to get flooded now and it's going to be a problem. <laughs> I've just opened the floodgates, but no, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm happy we did it. I know previously like prospect guys like, Hey, win an event and you guaranteed a spot. And I was hoping it would prime some, some guys, but I mean, I'm almost through the whole pro list. So I got to, I got to get through and I want to <laughs> do more, like I want to do more spotters and staff and mechanics and stuff too. Cause like the stories and the conversations I've had with like, just, just everybody in FD is incredible. And it's such a shame that not everybody gets to hear them. So that's kind of, <clears throat> that's going to be one of my next ones is like crew chiefs, I think is, is my next big, my next no. big push. And that's great, right? Like, I love how you have taken the initiative to do this, going back to what, what do we do here at Formula Drift? And it is entertain and you entertain people by crafting stories that resonate with the general audience. And by giving that insight behind the scenes, look, of not just drivers, but everybody else that is involved in the sport. I think that is super valuable. And I hope that helps, you know, again, build the audience of this amazing sport that, again, just I love to be involved in. Well, I appreciate that, man. That's, uh, I mean, it's literally the least I can do. I, I mean, I'm getting paid to talk, so I'm, I'm pretty happy. And if people, you know, get something out of it, then that's, that's a bonus for me. So, um, yeah, thanks for reaching out. I'm glad we got this sorted. I know we were back and forth a little bit and I'm glad S tech was able to, to get some gear to you with short notice and we got a mic to you like at the 11th hour and it worked <laughs> out, it worked out perfectly. So, uh, yeah, for everybody listening and watching at home, please, uh, if you're listening, jump on YouTube and watch because the backdrop was kind of cool to like watch the sun kind of set and fade out. Worked out well. Um, and for everybody that's uh, watching, you know, make sure to subscribe on whatever podcast platform, every single subscriber, every single listen helps. And uh, Nate, thanks again, man. I, I appreciate it. And I'll see you in Atlanta. Yep.